Good morning, City Church, and welcome to those who are watching online. We are so, so excited that you're here with us this morning. If this is your first time here, please fill out a Connect card, or you can text WELCOME to 386-603-9131. We just want to connect with you and answer any questions that you may have. Each month, we have the opportunity to give back to some amazing organizations. Our partner of the month will provide an hour of education for adults who live in Senegal. All you have to do is check in on Facebook. Go ahead and take your phone out and snap a selfie with your favorite neighbor and use the hashtag education for all and check in on Facebook to make a difference to those in need. The mission of our church is to see those far from God be raised to life in Christ. Your faithful giving makes this possible. All you have to do is text any amount to the number 84321, or you can give directly through the Church Center app. Man, how many of you are excited that, that summer's here, summertime's here? Where are my summertime people? Yeah, you don't have kids, right? They stay home. But yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy summertime. And over the next uh, four weeks in the month of June, uh, we're going to be in a series called Summer Playlist. And what we're going to do is take the message that is in portions of music of could be a uh, from from a movie one week we might be encouraging you to get away from the shallows come on somebody a little wordplay and get to the deep things of God and so over the next few weeks uh, we're going to be taking the, the message that's out of the music because how many of you know music has the ability to take you back come on somebody there's some certain songs when they come on yeah yeah it takes you to that place in space sometimes it might be unhealthy Sometimes it could be. And so what I want to do is go on this spiritual journey and apply some spiritual principles and truth to some of the messages that's in the music. Now, I don't endorse the music. I don't. Then let me just the cats out of the bag. I really don't listen to a whole lot of music other than worship music and invest in, in my thought life. That's what I do a lot of. I invest in my thought life. But there are certain uh, movies and songs that are popular to to culture, and I'm going to take those those messages and present them in such a way that if you hear them on the radio, you'll be reminded of this moment, and it'll help you out doing so. Amen. All right. So if you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalm 73. We'll be in verses one through five. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read read the message. I'm going to read read the portion of scripture, and then I'm going to introduce what segment of song that it came from. And please. Please feel free to sing along with that segment of song so I don't feel so awkward up here, okay? Because some of you, when we play this song, some of you men are going to be like, man, you just, we're revoking your man card. <laughs> the things I do, man, to teach. Okay, Psalm 73, verses 1 through 5, with your, when you're ready, say, I'm ready, Pastor. No doubt about it, God is good. Come on, say amen to that. Good to good people, good to the good hearted, but I nearly, the psalmist is saying, listen, I nearly missed it. I missed seeing his goodness. I was looking the other way, looking up to the people at the top, envying the wicked who have, have it made, who has nothing to worry about, not a care in the whole wide world. Today's playlist comes from an award-winning movie. How many of you heard The Greatest Showman? All right, so you can recognize this song. If we can go ahead and, and hit it, and you can sing it, ladies, guys. I know you're not going to sing it. Just bear with me, guys. Come on, sing it if you know it. Yes, never enough. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, never enough. Now, wasn't that fun? Now you've gotten a little loose. Can we talk about it for a little bit? Shout amen if we can. Amen. Yeah, contentment, discontentment. It is a cancer that runs rapid in our culture. Would you agree with me? Like, discontentment is like the, the, the thing that runs through our culture. No one's satisfied. Nobody is happy with what they have. And so it, it seems like this discontentment is running rampant through our culture. And one of the things that fuels, fuels discontentment is this thing called comparison. 
How many of you ever heard of the comparison trap? It, what it does is it blinds you to all the good things and that what the psalmist is saying, that all the good things, like all the good things. I know God is good theologically. God is good all the time and all the time God is, yeah, theologically I understand that. But there are times in our life and we see the psalmist struggling emotionally, psychologically. He's taking a look and he's canvassing the, 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 the lives of those that are around him. And he has been blinded and he nearly missed it. Blinded to the goodness of God in his own life because he was so focused on other people. Because it's real easy to look around and see all the good things in someone else's life. And when we do so, we can be blinded to all the good things God has done in our own life. And so we have blinded eyes to God's blessing. And that's where the, the psalmist is. He's in this emotional, unhealthy condition to where he's looking around. One translation says, I stumbled and I nearly missed the goodness of God when it showed up in my life. Because I was so focused on everyone else and everything else that everyone else had that I nearly missed what God had done in my life. And a lot of us in the human condition, we can be blinded to what God is doing in our own personal life. And we can lean towards what everyone else has, what everyone else is doing, what everyone else is going and so we, we see it. And if you're not intentional about it, you'll naturally in your human condition drift to always looking and focusing on what someone else has while being blinded to what God has brought into your own life. It happened in John chapter 21 after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter and Jesus are having a conversation. Peter went back to fishing after the resurrection because it's easy to go back to what's familiar. Peter was a fisherman, and so Peter went back to fishing and took the disciples with him. And the Lord was on the shore cooking some fish. And John in his gospel said, it's the Lord. And Peter, he jumps out of the boat. It's almost like a Forrest Gump moment, like Lieutenant Dan, and he jumps out, and he's swimming to shore. He's swimming to shore. But Jesus and Peter have an important conversation on that shore. Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter responded, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus responded, well, take care of my sheep. Then he asked the second time, Peter, do you love me? Peter responded, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, then tend to my sheep. And then a third time, the Lord asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, it's almost like he was like frustrated. He said, yes, Lord, you know, you know all things. Yes, I love you. He says, tend, tend to my lambs. And then in the next verse, after this conversation, he begins to, to speak something very important to Peter. He says, when you were young, you were girded up yourself and you walk where you wish. But when you are old, you will be stretched out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. He was signifying, he spoke this signifying what death he would glorify God. And then when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciples whom Jesus loved, that being John. And he, he, goes, and he goes on to say, who is also leaned at his breast and at his supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrayed you? So John is identifying himself in the gospel. Then Peter, turning around, said to John, like, said about John, what about this man? Now, hold on. I want you to catch this. Jesus and Peter are having a conversation concerning what type of death Peter is going to die. It would be an opportunity if I was Peter to ask some maybe more in-depth questions. It's a pretty important conversation. Let's just say this. If Jesus was to show up in your life and started communicating what kind of death you were going to die, wouldn't you want to lean into that conversation a little bit? 
But what does Peter do? Peter turns around and says, what about John? What about, what about, what about John? And Jesus says this, if I want him to live and remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, Peter, John is none of your business. You need to stay focused on me. And so the tendency, listen to me and listen to me real good. It's hard to stay focused on Jesus if all you're concerned about is what's going on in John's life. And a lot of us, we want to follow Jesus, but we look to John. There's sometimes that we pray and we might be talking to Jesus, but we're really looking at John. And we cannot, listen to me, you cannot get distracted with looking at John and expecting to follow Jesus and experience Jesus in in the fullest. And too many of us, we lose our focus. Well, what about what about John? This is an important conversation. You're having a conversation about what kind of death you're gonna die, and all of a sudden you want to go, what about him? Because in our listen to me, in our humanity, we'll naturally gravitate to questioning the speck in someone else's eye while not even acknowledging the log that's in our own. And the psalmist is there. He's emotionally unhealthy. He's at this place where he's psychologically, he knows theologically God is good, but he is seeing all this happen in the lives of people who are not even in covenant with God. And we can be so focused, listen to me, focused on the Johns in our life that we neglect the Jesus. And there's a lot of things that Jesus wants to communicate to you that you'll miss as long as you're focused on John. And there was, this was an important conversation. Like I would have been like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Like, hold, hold up, wait a minute, wait a minute. But no, Peter's just worried about pointing to John. And I think a lot of us, we get caught up in doing that. A lot of us get caught up in this discontentment because we're more concerned with what's happening in John's life that we've been blinded to the goodness of God that's happening in our own life. We're blinded to it. And so we see Jesus and Peter having a conversation with Peter having more concern about what's going on in John's life instead of leaning in to what Jesus is actually saying. And many of us get caught up. I think we all suffer from spiritual we're spiritual rubberneckers let's just just put it like that how many of you have just been on i-75 and traffic been backed up for you know from a wreck from a crash just to roll by it and it's not even in your like it's completely across the media how many of you have done that before yeah a couple a couple of us and you're you're like you really like want to go like Kung Fu Billy Ninja on some people because you've waited an hour and you've realized that this isn't even in my lane. But yet we've got so many people that are looking at what's happening in the other lane that you can't efficiently get through the lane that you're called to be in. And I'm telling you, listen to me, people of God, we could be, we could move faster and further if we'd stay focused on Jesus instead of breaking our neck worried about John. And I know in a day and age of social media, listen to me, we, that we, we've got windows into everyone's life. And a lot of you are emotionally unhealthy, psychologically unhealthy, because you, you're looking into things that you were never meant to look into. Some of you need to stop the stroll and save your soul. Some, come on, it's the, it's the, it's the scroll that's paying a toll on your soul. Come on, I, I, I know I'm white, but I'm going to throw down. I feel it. <laughs> I got that Dr. Seuss anointing. <laughs> Too many cat in the hats. <laughs> but seriously, isn't that what the psalmist is doing? He's looking into everyone's life and just think, like the few, the few little, little lives that he was able to look into compared to us at any moment and at any time we can pull out of our pocket the digital device of depression and discouragement and discontent. And then we start looking, look at all, look at all the, look at them. 
And I think it plays a, a toll on your soul more than you realize. And it can blind you to the blessings that God has brought into your own life. It can, it can rob you of some conversations that Jesus wants to have concerning your life because you're more concerned about what's happening in everybody else's life. We stay more focused on John than Jesus. And we suffer f- from spiritual rubberneckers. Come on, we're the rubberneckers. Like always looking into someone else's life. And it's the human condition and it's the tendency that we've all been challenged with. I mean, it started in the garden, discontentment. All these trees you may eat freely from, but this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. All these trees, like perfect environment, perfect condition. You, I mean, you talk about the goodness of God. Come on, you talk about the favor of God. Are you kidding me? This is a perfect environment with a perfect fall. Everything is perfection. I mean, men, husbands, men naked with your wife with no kids. Praise the Lord. I know. It's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, babe. <laughs> but yet, what, what was the human tendency? Come on. The one, one, one tree, the one tree, the one tree, the one, just the one that you couldn't have. You focused on it and it, like ignored all the ones that you could. It's the human condition. You know, that's why the Bible says not to covet. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Because this, this is the reality. You cannot envy what others have and enjoy what you have at the same time. Envy will rob you of enjoyment. And Adam and Eve were coveting the one thing, envying the one thing they couldn't have, and it blew the the ability to enjoy all these trees you may eat freely from. And so in our human condition and our human humanity and our tendency is to look at the thing. Like, look at John. Like, what about John? And it's Jesus. Like, what about him? And it's hard to see the goodness of God in our own life when we're so focused on others, it makes us so emotionally unhealthy. Psychologically, we can't, I mean, it is, it is toxic. And we see the psalmist, he's, he's spiraling. He's in a tailspin emotionally. Verse three, it says, for I envy, I envy the proud. And when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness, they seem to live such painless lives and their bodies are so healthy and strong. Come on, somebody. It's, he almost sounds like a teenager throwing a, a hissy, like a, tantrum, a temper tantrum. They don't have trouble like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace. They clothe themselves with cruelty, them fat cats. Come on, I guess that's kind of like a biblical cuss word, you fat cat having everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil in their pride. They seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused. They drink in all their words. Like they got, they got prosperity. They got power. They got influence. They have all these things, Lord. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Come on, I think we've all, we've all been there when we've looked around. Look at them. Look at their power. Look at their prosperity. It just seems like their wealth multiplies. It just seems like, like no matter what they do, I mean, they've, they've got all this influence. And I, I'm, I'm over here, and I'm struggling to see the goodness of God. And you've got people that aren't even in covenant with you, God, scoffing and, and, and mocking you. And here, here they are. Here they are prospering. And I'm upset about it. I'm in a rage. I'm in a tailspin, spiraling emotionally because all I see is is what is happening in everyone else's life and it seems so good and I'm blinded to what's happening in my own. Then he goes off to say that his heart was bitter. He had a bitter heart and was torn up on the inside. 
because blinded eyes will lead to a bitter heart. You can feel it in the text. Look at them. When we become blinded to the blessing and the goodness of God in our own life, it creates a bitter heart. Not because of a lack of what's in our hand, but what activity is taking place in our heart. I was tore up on the inside. Like my blinded eyes led to a bitter a bitter heart. You know the Proverbs, chapter 4 and verse 23? It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Come on, if you have issues, how many of you have issues? Are they sitting on your row? Just look forward if they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not from the lack of what's in your hand. Can I tell you it comes from the heart? The issues come from the heart. Well, some of you are having a hard time believing that because you've made this comment, well, if I just had more in my hand, then it would affect my heart. And that's not true because we know a lot of people that can have a lot of things in their hand, a lot of wealth, a lot of, a lot of accolades, a lot of success. And some of the people that have the fullest hands have the most emptiest hearts. And there are some people that we know, come on, don't have hardly anything in their hand, but their heart is so filled with joy and peace and love. And here's the tendency, and here's the deception. Well, if I, get just, if, I can, if I can get more in my hand, then that means I'll have more in my heart. And that's not the case. And the issues and the struggles, can I tell you, it, come, it comes from, from the heart. Like relationally, like in, in our marriages, in our struggle, it's, come on, I'm not saying that you don't have challenges, struggles, and issues on the outside. I don't say that you don't have struggles, challenges, and issues on the outside. But what I am saying is the issue, it's a matter of the heart. Come on, you, you take somebody who's, who, who might be selfish and then turn them into a selfless person from their heart. Can I tell you the relationship gets better as a byproduct? Issue, issues of the heart. Friendship. It was an issue, it's issues of the heart. And so the psalmist is realizing, listen, my blinded, my blinded eyes has created a bitter heart, and it's, I'm tore up on the inside. I'm tore up all on the inside. That I'm, to the degree I can't hardly recognize God's goodness in my life. And I'm envy. And when I envy, I can't enjoy. Like towers, towers of gold. Come on, isn't that what the song said? Towers of gold are still too little. These hands can hold the world, but it'll never be enough. Thank you for the one person that's with me on this message and all, all, the, guys, all the guys that are criticizing me for the choice of song. I, I feel it. I feel the criticism. I'm keeping my man card. I'm keeping it. It's in my wallet. But the, the truth is, is that it, it'll never Never be enough because it's not about what's in my hand. It's about what's in my heart. Come on, keep, keep it. And let me just say this. I get it. You can't choose the hand that you're dealt. Come on, there are times that you might have a, you might have a pretty, you might be a, dealt a pretty bad hand, but you do have the choice to respond to it, right? You might not, like the word says, today is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice in it. Today is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice in it. I didn't make the day, but I do get to choose because when it comes to contentment and satisfaction, it is not based off a feeling. It is based off a choice. And so many of us are allowing our feelings to do the choosing in our life. No, today is the day the Lord has made. I don't have any control. I didn't control that hand, but I will rejoice. I got that ability. I can choose to no, no matter what my it is. Come on, I can step in it. It can hit the fan, but I've already made a decision. I will rejoice. I don't care if I got it on my feet as I walk and I can smell like it. I'm still going to rejoice because it's not based off of how I feel. 
It's based off of what I choose. And I will not let my feelings lead my life. I let faith lead my life. And when I let faith lead my life, my feelings will follow. So today is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice because I don't make a decision based off my feelings. I make a decision based off the word of God. Period. Be like, yeah, you see that? You see that right there? Yeah, I'm going to have to buy a whole new pair of shoes. Praise the Lord. I get new shoes today. Like you don't, you, you might not be able to control the hand that you're dealt, but you do have control of how you respond to the hand that you're dealt. You get to choose how you see it and what you say about it. And too many of us are letting our feelings do the choosing. And as long as the feelings are making the choices in your life, come on, the number two enemy, like if the number one enemy of discontent, of, or the number one enemy of contentment is comparison, can I tell you the number two enemy of contentment is complaining? Because you cannot complain and be content at the same time. That's why the foundation, like the, the, the fruit of contentment and satisfaction might be a feeling, but the root of it, the foundation, is a choice that I choose to make in spite of my circumstance, in spite of my situation, in spite of the conditions, because my fulfillment, my satisfaction, and my contentment doesn't come from what's in my hand. It comes from what's in my heart. And if we get to a place to where we're disciplined enough and we're moved by faith, and not by feelings. Now, listen, I'm not telling you not to process your feelings. I'm not. You need a good therapist, a counselor. Everybody does. Everybody needs a place that they can process feelings. I'm not t- trying to tell. This isn't put your head in the sand theology. You've got feelings. But what I am saying is when it comes to choices that you make, we allow the word of God to make those choices for us. So today is the day the Lord has made. And I don't care what kind of it I've got to deal with. I'm going to rejoice in it. And we become blinded, blind eyes and bitter, bitter heart. Come on, the third, third thing is, is that the psalmist, he gets to a place in verse 22, 23. And team, you can help me out. He said, I was foolish and ignorant. Come on, a little bit of self-awareness, right? It goes a long ways. Sometimes the, like, you got to get honest with yourself. I was so foolish and ignorant. It's, it's, not, it's not what's out there. It's me. And sometimes you have to get to the end of yourself and get honest with yourself. And he says, I must seem like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. He's saying, listen, I was stupid. I was foolish. It's dumb. I must have seemed like some ignorant, ant, like, wow, senseless animal. But here's the thing, parents. I mean, we can identify with this. As stupid as your kids act, they still belong to you, right? You're not going to discard them, throw them away. I mean, <laughs> can I share something with you that happened Monday? I work Monday, Memorial Day, you guys. But I, I'm by vocation, I work. And so I got home from working while everybody else was you know, enjoying their their month Memorial Day. And I come in the house and Grace, she come at me sideways. You know what she said, y'all? She was upset. She said, we hadn't done nothing all summer long. I said, including cleaning your room. Now get your butt in there and clean it because you ain't cleaned it all summer long. It's like, in that moment, I just wanted to go. You get, get outside. I mean, what, you going to try me like that? Talk about we ain't done nothing all summer. We six hours into it. Come on. Girl. And I've been working those six hours. But, but here's the point. He, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And yet, here, here's, here's the thing. The psalmist has come to this realization and his emotional maturity 
to get to a place to realize, you know what, my contentment, my satisfaction, and my fulfillment doesn't come from what's in my hand. It comes from who holds my hand. You hold my right hand. And let me just say this. If God is not enough for you, then nothing will ever be enough. But when God is enough, then everything is enough. And so many of us, come on, we, we wrestle with discontentment. And I don't know what it could be. It could be a bitter heart. Let me just say this about the heart. Is that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, your mouth is the ventilation system to your heart. And so whatever's coming out of your mouth, it reveals what's in your heart. And so if you've got a, come on, a complaining heart or a complaining mouth, there's, come on, somebody. It's like, I know what's in your heart by what comes out your mouth. If you're angry, Right? It comes out your, it's in your heart. If you're frustrated, it comes, it's in your heart. But the psalmist has gotten to this emotional maturity to where at least he's self-identifying that the issue and the struggle and the things that I'm dealing with isn't because of my condition on the outside. It's because of my, my heart on the inside. And he gets to this place and he's like, I realize, I realize my contentment, my satisfaction. It, it does not come from what's in my hand. It comes from who holds my hand. It's his right hand. I love that. I love the right hand because the right hand, how many right-handed people do we have in the house? Yeah, predominantly. How many left-handed people? Y'all are special. Yeah, them two back there are real special. I know y'all personally. (laughs) But normally, normally, you know, your right hand is your dominant hand. It's my place of provision and protection and I provide and it's my strong hand. And so, when the psalmist says, man, you grab me by my, my right hand, he's submitting, he's submitting, the, the psalmist is submitting his strength. He's submitting his source of power, his source of provision. He's saying, I'm, I'm placing, I'm placing it in, in your hands, God, because I know contentment and satisfaction and fulfillment does, has nothing to do with what's in it and everything to do with who holds it. And I can tell you as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a leader, I want, I want to feel God's, I want to feel God's presence leading me and guiding me and shaping me and molding me. It's not about what's in my hand. It's about who holds my hand, who leads me, who guides me, who I submit my authority because the right hand's of power and authority, who I submit to. He's saying, I'm getting to, I've got to that place. It, it, it was me. Like, I, I didn't choose the hand that I was dealt, but I'd get to choose how I respond to it. And I know, like, Hebrews chapter 13, you'll never, you'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. It's just, let your conduct be without covenantness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if God's not enough, nothing will ever be enough. And when we submit to him, take my right hand, Lord. It's not my strength. It's not by might, but it's by your spirit. I submit to your authority. I submit to your leading. I submit to your guidance. I, I submit. And if he's got me by my right hand, that means to walk with me, he's got to grab me with his left And one of the images that I thought about this week when I pictured that was almost with my my girls when they were, they were babies, like toddlers. When you're a toddler, you can't reach the good stuff in the pantry. And when they were hungry, they would come and grab you by the, somebody say hand. Because they want to show you what they want. Daddy, come, come in, come in there. And we would stand in front of the pantry and I'd hold her, her little hand. And I'd say, all right, what you want? You want that? She'd be like, no. Said, you want this? No. You want that? No. You, you're not getting this last oatmeal pie. Is that what you want? Because that's the tithe to dad. Like, that's holy. You want this? Okay. Here's, here's the point, the imagery. It may have been out of her reach, but it wasn't out of daddy's reach. 
And there's a lot of things that you'll never be able to reach as long as it's just your hand. But when you submit to God and you allow him to lead you, to guide you, to to empower you, when you stand in front of the pantry of life and you look and you say, I I, I would like that. Daddy says, I know you can't reach it, but I can. I can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ask or think. You can't do it in your own ability. You can't do it in your own strength. And I get that we can be emotionally unhealthy because we look into the windows of other people's lives that we're blinded to the things that God is doing in our life. And we can get to a place to where we have a bitter heart. But if you come to the end of yourself and you realize that you can submit your life to God, you can place your hand in daddy's hand. There's some things that may be out of your reach, but it ain't never out of daddy's reach. I don't know what it is. I don't know what your oatmeal pie looks like. Your fudge round, your nutty buddy. But there wasn't a single thing in that pantry that my girls wanted. I want that. That's the last one. Here. Gotta be quicker. (laughs) I think a lot of us, we get to a place where we try to do it And I want to ask, I want to ask this. I don't know what area of life that you're discontent in. But can I tell you the solution to it? It isn't just doing it, trying to fix it in your own strength. It's submitting and surrendering to God, laying it down and allowing God to lead your life, whether it's relationally, professionally, financially. I don't know. I don't know what area that discontentment, but it doesn't have to... It doesn't have to stay that way. Maybe it's in your marriage. It doesn't have to stay that way. Come on, when we submit and surrender under the power and the authority of God, he can help us reach things that we would never be able to reach in our own strength. There's a level of joy that you you haven't reached yet. You might be saying, well, pastor, I'm pretty joyful. Well, you can be more joyful. Contentment contentment that's the will of God for your life and you can acquire it not by looking into the lives of other people not with a bitter heart not complaining not comparing but surrender and submitting like the song said towers of gold still too little these hands could hold the world but it'll never be enough because the only thing that'll ever be enough in your life is God And when you're secure, confident, fulfilled, and satisfied with his presence in your life, day after day after day after day, and you start to look around and you see God's goodness. Come on, you see God's favor. You see God's faithfulness. I know those kids are driving you crazy right now, but here, let me help you out. They, they might be driving you crazy now. I want you to go to a place in your mind where you're 80 years old and they're all grown. You'd give anything to be back in that season. Come on, as fast as I see my kids growing up, I want time to slow down. Sometimes in our mind, we we gotta remove ourselves so we can see from the outside looking at God's blessing. He helps us do it. When we submit, surrender our lives to him. Would you stand with me all over this place? Hey, can we put our hands together for God?